Hi, thank you for tuning in for today's message from Calvary in Lake Havasu. Today, Pastor Chad has a great message about our freedom in Christ. We are studying Paul's letter to the church in Corinth and looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and chapter 10 verses 23 through 33. As always, Life Notes can be downloaded at calvaryaz.com forward slash Life Notes. Now, here is Pastor Chad Garrison. Hey, go ahead and grab your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 8. 1 Corinthians 8 is our text today. And uh, if you're in the room and you don't have a Bible, grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. Turn to page 1136 and you'll be able to follow along with us. Uh, and uh, if you're joining us online uh, and you would like a Bible, you don't have one, uh, message us, we'll get you a Bible. If you're in the room and you don't have a Bible, then uh, take one of those with you. It's our gift to you. We want you to have God's Word and read God's Word because we know if you read and apply God's Word, God will change your life. Hey, today we are talking about freedom. I, I hope you like that reference to Braveheart. Uh, but uh, question, do you value freedom? I mean, do you really value freedom? I mean, do you love being free? Okay, so is freedom worth fighting for? See, uh, I think it is. I think freedom is worth fighting for. In fact, our nation fought for its freedom, its independence from uh, Great Britain way back uh, in 1776. Our nation uh, fought for the freedom of slaves in the Civil War. In World, World Wars I and II, we fought to protect the world and ourselves from tyranny so that we could live as free people. Uh, our history says that freedom is worth fighting for. And for the record, Jesus won the fight for our freedom when he gave himself on the cross as a sacrifice for our sins. Because we were enslaved to sin and death and hell. We, we were its victims. We were imprisoned by those things. It held us captive and we were powerless to set ourselves free. And Jesus broke the bonds of sin and death and hell through his death and resurrection. That's why Jesus said, if the son has set you free, you were free indeed. If the son has set you free, you are free indeed. So I want you to know that we are free to live for God's glory. If you're a follower of Jesus, if you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, if you believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead, and, and, and you've made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, then he has set you free, and, and, and you are free to live for his glory. 1 Corinthians 10, 31 declares, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. Did you catch that? So whatever you do, eating, drinking, playing, working, living at home, do everything for the glory of God. That's, that's what we're called to do. So we're free to live for God's glory. So as a follower of Jesus, you are free from, uh, you're free from sin. You don't have to sin. You're free from fear. You don't have to be afraid. You're free from rules as long as your words and your deeds and your actions are for the glory of God. And some of you are going, what does it mean to be for the glory of God? What does it mean to live for his glory? Well, first of all, you've got to do what his word says. Since we already talked about reading and applying God's word, that's where it begins. But I just want you to know you are free in Christ. If the son has set you free, you're free indeed. Now, if you're not yet a follower of Jesus, we just want you to know uh, our understanding of life is that you're enslaved by sin. You're a prisoner of death and hell is your eventuality and we don't want you to experience that so we want you to discover freedom in Christ. And if you wanna to talk to someone about that today, we would love to do that. Our prayer team is gonna be here at the front you can talk to them, pray with them after the service. There'll be pastors available. You can grab a connect card, fill it out, and say, I'm gonna talk to someone about Jesus. We will call you, we will contact you because we want you to experience that freedom in Jesus Christ. But uh, if you're a follower of Jesus, then you are free and you are free to live for God's glory. And, and that is amazing and wonderful news. 
and, and in, at least the Christians I've been around most of my life, that's amazing and wonderful news that immediately causes them to panic. I'm free. What am I free to do? What can I do? Can I do this? Can I do that? I don't know. How do I determine that freedom? It, it, it actually reminds me when I was a youth pastor and I'd be talking to, you know, teenagers about dating and honoring God with your body. And, and they would always ask the question. They'd go, Pastor Chad, Pastor Chad. I go, yeah. And they go, how far can I go? You, you know the question, when, you know, in dating and in our relationships, like, how far can I go? And I go, well, you're already in sin by asking the question. Um, because you want to go places that God doesn't want you to go. Because you are free to live for God's glory. What's going to bring God glory? So we, we want to know what are the limits to our freedom. If we're free, then what determines our, our freedom? How far can we go? Well, our freedom naturally leads us to the question, what are the limits to freedom? What are the limits to our freedom? What are our limits to my freedom in Jesus? Because we're operating from this assumption that if you're asking that question, you love Jesus. You believe in Jesus. He's your Lord and he's your Savior. And, and you believe that the Bible is true and you want to honor Jesus with your life. You want to bring glory to God. And yet, even though we all feel that way as followers of Jesus, we fight over freedom. We fight over what we can and cannot do as Christians, just like the messed up church in Corinth. Since this is a message to a messed up church, let's read their fight about freedom. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, uh, the Apostle Paul writes, and, and by the way, this is going to sound weird to us, but just stick with me. It'll make sense in the end. He says, now concerning food offered to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge this knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. If anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not yet know as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. Therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence and that there is no God but one. For although there may be so-called gods in heaven and on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, Yet for us, there is one God, the Father from whom are all things and for whom we exist. And there is one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. However, not all possess this knowledge, but some through former association with idols eat food as really offered to an idol and their conscience being weak is defiled. Food will not commend us to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat, no better off if we do. But take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, will he not be encouraged if his conscience is weak to eat food offered to idols? And so by your knowledge, this weak person is destroyed, this brother for whom Christ died, thus sinning against your brothers and wounding their conscience when it is, when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble... I will never eat meat lest I make my brother stumble. I know some of you vegetarians love that. Um, flip over to page 10, or chapter 10, verse 23. It's one page over, because I want to pick up. I want to read verses 23 through 33, because they continue this thought about freedom. So Paul continues, verse 23, by saying, All things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. Let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. Eat whatever is sold in the meat market without raising any questions on the ground of conscience, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. If one of the unbelievers invites you to dinner and you are disposed to go, eat whatever is set before you without raising any question on the grounds of conscience. But if someone says to you, well, this meat has been offered in sacrifice, then don't eat it for the sake of the one who informed you and for the sake of conscience." I do not mean your conscience, but his. For why should my liberty be determined by someone else's conscience? If I partake with thankfulness, why am I denounced because of that for which I give thanks? So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give no offense to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God, just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that of many that they may be saved. Um, 
Let me give you a little bit of background on why this is such a big deal to the church in Corinth. Um, Christianity was only uh, Jewish people for the first 10 years or so of, of its existence. Nobody else believed in Jesus. It was completely a Jewish thing. Uh, you know, the, the apostles were in Jerusalem, the church was in Jerusalem. And so they, they had one culture and that was Jewish culture. And so all the Christians also were good Jews. They would, you know, they were circumcised. They would go make sacrifices in the temple. They would observe all the uh, religious festivals of Judaism. And then under the apostle Paul, the gospel spread to Gentiles all over the world. So thousands upon thousands of uh, people became followers of Jesus Christ who had no connection whatsoever to Judaism or the Jewish faith. And a, a group of Jewish Christians called Judaizers by historians said, no, 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 if you're gonna follow Jesus, you have to become Jewish and then you can follow Jesus. So in other words, they said, if you're gonna be a believer in Jesus Christ, you've gotta get circumcised and you've gotta keep the food laws and you gotta observe all the Sabbaths and you gotta observe all the rituals and the holidays. You gotta to go to the temple and sacrifice. They, they said, you gotta do all of that. So in Acts chapter 15, it records this big gathering of people. And the apostle Paul said, no, here's what happened with the Gentiles and they're saved by grace. And these other people said, no, they have to become Jewish to become Christians. And the apostles heard both sides. And then they said, this is how God is leading us. It is by grace alone that you are saved. You do not have to become Jewish to be a follower of Jesus. I say, amen. Otherwise, most of us you know, here and online, would, we'd be in trouble. So, um, but they said this, even though you don't have to become Jewish, they, they didn't write this in their instructions. They said, write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols and from sexual immorality and from what, it, what has been strangled and from blood. So, so they didn't want them just to eat, you know, idol meat and things like that because that was offensive to the Jewish believers. And they, and they recommended against it. Now, today, None of us care about food sacrifice to idols. It is a non-issue. We hear this, I hear this, and I go, ah, so what? It's food sacrifice to idols. We don't have to deal with it. It's no big deal. But back then, it was huge. Yeah, I mean, they were ready to divide the church over this whole issue of food sacrifice and idols. And in Corinth, it was a big deal because in Corinth, they had the temple to Aphrodite, actually multiple temples, and they, and they made money for this temple off of basically two things. They made it off of religious prostitution, people paying for religious prostitutes as an act of worship, and they made it because people would bring animals and offer them a sacrifice to Aphrodite, and then the uh, priests would take the sacrificed animals because they couldn't eat it all, and they would sell it in the marketplace to make money for the temple. And sometimes they would sell the meat, really good meat, because you had to bring really good animals at a reduced rate because they weren't butchers, they weren't farmers, they were just like, hey, let's cash in on the leftover meat that we're not able to eat. So, um, for them, that's what it was all about. And so some Christians in Corinth believed it was wrong to ever eat idol meat because it had been offered to another God. And some Christians in Corinth were like, ah, oh, that God's fake. It doesn't matter. God made it. I'm, I'm a good steward. I'm gonna buy really good meat for a, a discounted price. And they were fighting over the limits of their freedom. What are we allowed to do as followers of Jesus? Uh, today, Christians still fight over these type of things. We just, instead of idol meat, we fight over other things, just different issues. Like some churches fight over the way you dress for church, obviously not at Calvary. Uh, some people fight over the Bible version that you read. Some people fight over you know, the length of your hair. Guys have to have short hair, women have to have long hair. Uh, some churches fight over whether you can dance or not. Doesn't matter what church I go to, I'm still incapable of dancing. Uh, some churches fight over alcohol consumption. Can you drink, can you not drink? Nowadays, you have to fight over marijuana too. And can you use that? It's legal. Some fight over gambling, whether you can gamble. Some fight over movies, can, can, whether can you go to movies or not. Some fight over, you know, music. I remember growing up, I was like, don't listen to that devil music. Uh, all kinds of things that churches want to fight over. Can we engage in that? So this issue of freedom is still a real one. The problem is we judge each other based on our differing values and we evaluate spiritual maturity based on extra biblical standards. I know that's a mouthful, let me say it again. Here's the problem. We start judging each other based on our values that are not biblical. 
I think it's wrong to do this. You're doing that. I judge you. And we equate spiritual maturity to standards that are not in Scripture. They're not God's standards. So we try to impose our limits on other churches. You're saying, I don't do that. No, but most of the churches you've been to in your lifetime tried to do that in some way, shape, or form. I know because I grew up in those churches, and they tried to limit a lot of things that we did. All right, here's, here's a little bit of confession. I remember the, 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 when the movie Animal House was coming out. Anybody else remember Animal House? Okay. I, don't confess. You just can raise your hand that you remember it. You're not confessing that you saw it. And, uh, and I remember when that was coming out, and our youth pastor said, don't go see this movie. And the whole youth group showed up at the movie theaters on Friday night to see Animal House. Uh, I just showed up to see what kind of, you know, sinners were going to see Animal House. Uh, not really. I, I wanted to see it because they told us we shouldn't. So we try to impose our limits on other people. So again, what are the limits to freedom? What are the limits to freedom? So in these passages, 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and 10, the Apostle Paul makes some strong statements that clarify our limits of freedom. Uh, these are boundaries for all the followers of Jesus who desire to live freely for God's glory. Remember, do whatever you want as long as it brings glory to Jesus. So these are four boundary lines, if you will, four limits that you need to apply to yourself. So let me just go through these. Most of these are found, well, they're all found in uh, chapters 8 and 10. So the first limit that God gives us is the limit of gratitude. It's gratitude. 1 Corinthians 10, 30, the Apostle Paul says, if I partake with thanksgiving or thankfulness, why am I denounced? Because of that for which I give thanks. So the first boundary line is gratitude. Uh, if we can give thanks with a clear conscience, then we're free. If we can give thanks and not feel guilty about what we're doing, then we're free. Uh, have you ever been on a vacation? Now, I'm not talking about like camping up in the Wallapies or something. I'm talking about, have you ever been on a fancy vacation? All right, see your hands, go ahead. You ever been on a cruise, something like that? Okay. So look, we, we've got friends that we cruise with from time to time. And I've been on some really fancy golf trips uh, and I'm not apologetic about those, but I've grown up in churches and around Christians who judged people for their extravagant vacations. And they say things like, you wasted money, you could give it to the church, you could feed the poor, you're being selfish. Now, here's the reality. I live generously. And God blessed me enough that I was able to afford to go on the trip or trips. I mean, you know, we save up money and we do that as part of our, our, uh, our budget, our plan. And, and I'm thankful for God's provision. I'm thankful for my wife that I get to travel with. I'm thankful for my kids, my family, because I've taken my kids all over the world, mostly on missions. Uh, I'm thankful for my friends that I get to travel with. I'm thankful for the beauty of God's creation. I'm giving thanks. And so I'm free. By the way, you know, one of the ways you can tell that you're not free is if you're always complaining. See, if you're griping and complaining about everything in life, you're not living with gratitude, and that exposes a place where you're living imprisoned as a slave to that negativity and that complaint. Gratitude is a boundary of our freedom. If you're free, if you're thankful, then you're free. So gratitude is a boundary for freedom, and serving is a boundary for freedom. 1 Corinthians 10, 24 says, let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. Let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. Um, we are free in Christ to serve others. We are free in Christ to seek the good of our neighbor. After all, Jesus said, you know, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's the first and great commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And Paul says, look, seek the good of your neighbor. We are free in Christ to serve others and to seek their good. That's an amazing freedom. See, before Jesus, we were all slaves to selfishness. And if we're honest, we enter back into that selfish thinking, that selfish mindset often. And every time we do, we're stepping into prison. But now we are free to bless other people. Now, in Philippians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul explains this in, in great detail when he says in uh, chapter 2, verse 3, he says, Do nothing from selfish ambition or empty conceit, 
but rather with humility of mind, consider others more important than yourself. Do not merely look after your own interests, but also the interests of others. Wow. You see, when you are serving others, you are truly free because that's what Jesus did, right? He served others, he was completely free, and he gave his life as a ransom for many. Now, it doesn't make sense that when you're serving others, you're free, but when you're living selfishly, you're imprisoned. But that's the reality. And see, Satan has done such a great job selling us on selfishness that we think what I want is to live selfishly and then I'll be happy. And people with money, people with opportunity, just they do just like that. They want what they want, they get what they want, and they're miserable. They might look happy from a distance. But up close, their lives are missing something real and significant, and that's the freedom that we have in Christ. When we serve, we are following Jesus into freedom. And if your life is consumed with self, it's evidence that you're living in a prison. So the first two limits on our freedom, gratitude and serving others. The third limit is the mission. The mission. Did you catch 1 Corinthians 10, Paul says, just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, which is impossible, by the way, uh, not seeking my own advantage. He's like, he's like, I'm not focused on me, but uh, that of the many. In other words, I want to bless many people, and here's the reason, that they may be saved. That they may be saved. Paul says, look, I'm not seeking my own advantage. I, I'm, I'm trying to please people, but I'm doing it because I want to see people come to a life-changing faith in Jesus Christ. I want people to know the Savior. I want people to experience forgiveness. I want people to know that heaven is their home, and the only way they do that is through Jesus. Paul says, basically, the mission is more important than your personal freedom. It's a boundary. It's that place where we go, oh, I don't wanna cross that line. So question, why do we do what we do at Calvary? It's not really a trick question. Why do we do what we do at Calvary? We, we, we exist to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. That's why we do what we do at Calvary. So if my freedom compromises the mission, I've gone too far. Let me say it again. If my freedom compromises the mission of Christ, I've gone too far. We are servants of Jesus set free to love and proclaim the good news. So if my actions get in the way of leading people to Jesus, I need to repent. Because then I'm a, a roadblock to them coming to faith, then I need to change my actions. I need to change my values. Now, honestly, most of the time, our actions that get in the way of people coming to Jesus are easily identifiable. The first one is the, the number one accusation that unchurched people make about church people. You already know what it is. What is it? It's right, hypocrisy. We're a bunch of hypocrites. And, and that means that we say one thing and we do another. And they're watching us and they're listening to us and, and we talk about uh, you know, how we love you know, Jesus and then we're you know, mean to our neighbor. They just see that hypocrisy and they go, oh, so you call yourself a Christian? No, thanks. That, that's, the, that's the number one thing that gets in the way of the mission. There's other things. You know, if we tell lies, we're getting in the way of the mission. If we're being selfish, we're getting in the way of the mission. If we're being mean to people, we're getting in the way of the mission. By the way, did you, did you remember that whole great commandment thing about love God and love your neighbor as yourself? All right. So if you're being mean to people, you're failing in that but it doesn't just mean being mean or selfish. If you're greedy, if you're cheap, if you're stingy towards others, it gets in the way of the mission. And let's be real practical. You know, how do you treat people in restaurants? Are you being a hypocrite there? Talking about the message when you go out to eat after service and, and you're rude to the waiter or wait, waitress, you're cheap on the tip? I mean, is that a great testimony for Jesus? Are you doing it for the glory of God at that, point, at that point? What about in the doctor's office when they make you wait longer than you want to wait? Because let's face it, none of us want to wait any length of time at all. But to be honest with you, we know we're going to wait. So why don't you go in there with a good attitude? Like, I'm going to have to wait two hours. And if they let you in in 30 minutes, you're like, yay! See, if we have that grumpy, mean attitude, uh, then that gets in the way of Jesus. Or what about <laughs> when you're driving, you know, are you, are you telling people where to go or are you uh, giving them a one-way sign to Jesus? I mean, honestly, 
It, it, road rage does not ever glorify Jesus. And speaking of rage, what about your attitude and your actions at your kids or grandkids' sporting events? You know, you know those people that are on the field being the umpires and the coaches, you know, a lot of them are doing that for volunteers or they're not getting paid much. And, and are you treating them with kindness and respect? Are you, are you encouraging people or are you just yelling and being rude and nasty? You see, our actions can get in the way of the mission. And if our freedom leads us to get in the way of the mission, then we need to repent. Uh, now, here's what's interesting to me. On this subject of the mission, it's usually church people who complain about our freedom, not the unchurched. At least this is my experience. Uh, so I've already been confessing, so I'll just keep confessing. Um, I like movies. I used to go a whole lot more than I do now, but uh, you know, pre-COVID, I'd go to a lot of movies. And, and I like stand-up comedy. And for both of those, I don't just stick to the Christian stuff. And so through the years, there have been some people who have rebuked me for my freedom. All of those people were Christians. You shouldn't be going to those movies. You shouldn't be going to those shows. Uh, but what's interesting is in those same places, in those same times, I've had God conversations with people who are unchurched. I've had conversations of grace with people who were surprised that a pastor was in a comedy show or, uh, you know, were having conversation at that movie. Uh, so it didn't get in the way of the mission, but there were Christians who told me it did. Uh, so I found that interesting. So uh, now I only go to movies or stand-up comedy with people who don't feel guilty sitting next to me. So, uh, but we, look, we need to value God's mission more than we value our personal freedom. It's a boundary. Fourth limit is love. Love. 1 Corinthians 8.1, Paul says, Now concerning food offered to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge, and this knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Did you catch the difference in that? Knowledge just puffs us up, makes us arrogant and proud. Love builds people up. Um, Love cares about the feelings of others and how our actions impact them. Uh, I don't know about you, but I've known plenty of Christians that are proud and, and it's easy for us to become self-righteous and to be, you know, know-it-all Christian jerks. And can I just tell you that Jesus doesn't call any of us to be jerks? In fact, Paul says, if anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not yet know as he ought to know. And so if you think you're full of knowledge, Paul's saying, check yourself because you don't know what you think you know. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. If we're motivated by love, we're free. Let me say that again. If we're motivated by love, we're free. And when I say motivated by love, I don't mean that you verbally declare that you love people or you love God. God does not care about our verbal declarations. He cares about our actions that demonstrate love. And you know what love is, according to the Apostle Paul? Yeah, I think you guys do. Love is patient. Love is kind. Okay, love is patient. Love is kind. If we're not being patient and kind, we're not showing love. We're acting out of knowledge that puffs up. And it's so tempting to be right about everything. It's so tempting in our relationships to want to win the argument, have the last word, instead of building the other person up. So, gratitude, serving, mission, love. Those are our boundaries. That, that's kind of the, the place that God has set our limits to freedom. And, and if you're sitting here thinking it's not rigid enough or legalistic enough, sorry, not really. Not sorry at all. You see, this is a personal challenge from God to each one of his children. By the way, this is why we tell you to read the Bible and apply it to your life. This is God saying, hey, I want you to walk with me and figure out your convictions and your freedom using God's word with gratitude, serving, mission, and love. That's what God wants you to do. He wants you to wrestle with freedom. And how can you do everything to God's glory? Um, now, here's the thing. We do not have the right to set limits on another person's freedom. Okay, we don't have that right to set limits on someone else's freedom. In other words, I can't take my convictions and apply them to you. 
Because then I'm trying to impose my convictions on your freedom, and that's not how this works. You need to live by your convictions about what God would have you to do and not to do, and not judge everyone else if their convictions don't match your convictions. If God doesn't prohibit something in Scripture, then each Christian has to decide, can I do that? If God says don't do it, you can't do it. There's no argument, there's no debate. It's not a matter of freedom, it's a matter of obedience. But I don't have the right or the responsibility to restrict your freedom beyond God's boundaries expressed in Scripture. Um, And the sad thing is churches do it all the time. Churches and pastors using the passage from today try to control people and tell them what they can and can't do. Uh, I've heard throughout my life growing up, your actions are causing others to stumble. Now, I've never had a Christian actually say to me, your actions are causing me to stumble. They always point to the mysterious others. Other people are being led astray. Not me, I'm too mature, but other people are being influenced negatively by your actions that you have to stop doing because I think they're wrong. Look, Churches operate in that way all the time. Because again, a lot of times churches want to control you. They don't want to challenge you to live free in Christ. And you wrestle with what scripture says. Uh, By the way, that statement, your actions are causing other people to stumble. uh, I think it's just manipulative and controlling. So when somebody says that, my skin crawls, my hair raises on the back of my neck, and my Pharisee detector goes off. Let me just give you two illustrations from my youth. This is me growing up in the church, and and these are issues that one is ancient, but the other is still going on. Uh, The first one, and I'm going to confess my nerdiness at this point, and I feel a little embarrassed to say this, but when I was in college, I played Dungeons and Dragons. You know, some of you are like, ooh, that's cool. Would you still want to play? And others of you are like, that's evil. Well, I played Dungeons and Dragons with a bunch of Christian guys in my college group, and, and not a bunch, but a few other nerds like me. And, uh, and we had fun and, and enjoyed the fellowship and actually never did anything that was ungodly in that gathering. Even had a chance to, you know, uh, meet some people who weren't Christians and share with them out of that context. But I was told repeatedly by other Christians that you can't be a good Christian if you play Dungeons and Dragons. And I was studying for ministry and I was uh, serving in the church and I was teaching Bible studies and I actually still play Dungeons and Dragons and I felt like, well, I'm growing closer to Jesus, but you're telling me I can't grow closer to Jesus, so one of us is wrong. Uh, I'll let you figure that out. But they were trying to control my life by their convictions because nowhere in the Bible does it say anything about Dungeons and Dragons. It, you know, it wasn't the occult, although some people equate the two. Uh, it really wasn't. Now, The other one that I grew up with uh, is the issue of consuming alcohol. Look, I grew up a good Baptist in Baptist churches my entire life, and those churches were so serious about people not drinking alcohol that they actually like would read it as a covenant oath that you're not gonna uh, participate in alcohol sales or consumption at all, and it was a big deal, and people judged your spirituality by alcohol. Now, for the record, I've never been a drinker, and I don't drink alcohol now, Uh, it's not because I think the Bible prohibits it. It's because I've got alcoholism in my family and I'm terrified because I got lots of compulsive behaviors and I don't even want to open the door to that. Especially if you've ever seen me drink Diet Pepsi. So, um, but here's the thing. I, I don't evaluate people's spiritual maturity by whether or not they drink alcohol. It's never, it's never been a, a big deal for me. If you drink alcohol, you drink alcohol. But I'm not judging you by that, that action because scripture doesn't say you can't drink, it just condemns drunkenness, excess, addiction. And we got a group for that, it's called Celebrate Recovery, it meets on Monday nights at 6.30, right here in this room. So, um, so I don't drink, but, but here's the thing, I don't evaluate people's spiritual maturity by whether or not they drink alcohol, I evaluate people's spiritual maturity, because we all have to, by their fruit. And the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That's what I'm looking for in someone's life. So once again, we are free to live for God's glory. You are free to live for God's glory. So be grateful. 
Put other people first. Value the mission while you love people. Because that's what freedom looks like. And Jesus died to set us free. Will you pray with me? Father, thank you for the way that you have loved us, the way that you have rescued us from the prison of sin and death and hell, and you have given us freedom. And God, we don't wanna use our freedom to indulge ourselves or to uh, uh, you know, engage in sin. We don't wanna use our freedom to hurt other people. We wanna use our freedom to glorify Jesus and advance the mission. So God, I pray that you would indeed set us free, that we would walk in that freedom and we would love incredibly, we would serve passionately, we would be thankful all the time, and we would want nothing more than to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. This is our prayer. We ask it in Jesus' name, amen. What a great thing it is to recognize and celebrate the freedom we have in Christ. But let's not forget the responsibility that comes with that freedom. It's important to consider others when we determine how we'll practice those freedoms. We have one more scheduled online community connection on Wednesday, August 16th. Whether you've already joined us for one or have been considering joining, I invite you to check it out. You can find the times and web link by visiting our events page found at calvaryaz.com forward slash events. Well, that will cover it for now. Thanks for listening. Please come back next week. Bye-bye.